Hi everyone, my name is Corel, and today we're going to be doing another From the Depths tutorial, this one on the basics of water movement. So the first thing we're going to do is take a look at all of our components for water movement. Over here in the Water Build tab, we've got first off the propellers. These are the basic uh, run-of-the-mill way that you move in the water. Uh, worth noting before I get into this that all of these components, with the exception of uh, sails need to be underwater uh, for them to operate. The air pumps will remove water, but we'll get to that later. Uh, but they still need to be under the surface of the ocean in order to operate effectively. Uh, so that's going to be a consistent thing across all of these, so I'm not going to mention it with each of them. But uh, back to our propellers here. We've got uh, four different types of propellers in two different sizes. And the ones in the same size here, the propeller and propeller circular, are the same component. They have the same um, properties, the same health, the same armor, the same thrust. Everything works the same for both of these components. The only difference there is visual. So feel free to use either of these depending on the aesthetics of the boat that you're trying to build. And we've also got the huge propeller, and those are... Uh, nine times the size of a, of a propeller. If I take a look at these, they are three by three by one. So if I was to, let's get a mirror alignment going on here. If I put these down, these are three by three. Uh, whereas if I put one of these down, they are one by one. So I can fit nine of these smaller ones in the size of one of the larger ones. However, and this is a common thing in From the Depths when you start dealing with propulsion components of this type, the small propeller produces less than one-ninth of the power of the huge propeller. If we see, we've got a max force of 150 on the small boat propeller and a max force of 3,000 on the large one. That is 20 times as much force on the huge propeller as it is on the small propeller, if I've done my mental math correctly. So... That is a lot more power coming out of that large propeller for the same space that you would get for using nine small propellers. So generally, if you have the space for a huge propeller and you have the power for it, obviously it takes a lot more power as well. Uh, five versus 75 there, so that's what, uh, 15 times as much power? Uh, regardless, um, quite a bit more power there. So the power output, is, or power draw rather, is quite a bit more. But in general, when you're talking about water movement, the amount of power draw that we're talking about consuming is more or less negligible. Uh, compared to the other subsystems of your vehicle, power draw is not going to be a huge concern for your propulsion components. So the increased power requirements of the huge propellers are not that onerous. They're not going to uh, bankrupt your engine. So I tend to prefer these uh, large propellers when we're talking about uh, driving things underwater. So uh, I'm actually going to remove those for a moment, and let's see, our center of mass is right about there. I'm going to add these for a quick demonstration. We're going to set these to turner presets on either side of this vehicle. Now, uh, if you think about a jet engine, when you fire a jet engine, you're propelling thrust out the back and that gives you forwards thrust, right? But it doesn't have the ability to go the opposite direction in a typical jet system. So the jets are monodirectional. They can only propel you in one direction. These propellers can push you in either direction. So the propeller over here is firing in one direction, uh, attempting to turn me, and the propeller over here is firing in the opposite direction, attempting to turn me. That's important to note. Uh, propellers are bi-directional. They will give you two directions of thrust, similar to a helicopter blade. All right, so the next component we're going to look at here, uh, there are two different types of rudders, and we're going to go with the simple ones first. Simple rudders are generally placed at the back of your vehicle. You generally want to get them as close towards the back as is practical. In this vehicle, I could put one right here. And this rudder is going to be pretty much automatically controlled. You generally don't have to worry about setup on these. And you can pretty much just plop, plop them down and go. It's really simple to set up. And they actually do a pretty good job of turning a boat. In fact, arguably they do a better job than the larger rudders that I'm about to show you. 
So this boat actually has one of these larger rudders, and I'm going to go underwater to show you this. Uh, this down here, I have a spin turn block, and I've set this up to control this rudder down here. Uh, this rudder is attempting to turn me as quickly as possible, um, and in order to set that up, I have gone into the spinner UI on the spin block, and that gives me spin rate control if I was wanting to do some sort of a propeller blade. More importantly, that gives me angle control. Angle control will let me use the output of a uh, movement axis request and uh, feed that into the turn and basically set myself at a specific angle. So in this case, I've got 20 degrees of yaw right here, um, or the general rotation. Uh, you'll also notice that I'm missing buttons up here in the presets and filters because the game does not have the smarts in it to figure out what is intended when you put a spin block down. It doesn't necessarily know that you're going to want to use that as a push or turn uh, thruster in any given direction, and there's so many things you could attach to the spin block, it's just not worth them adding those buttons there when most of the time what they would attempt to do would end up being wrong. So uh, instead, I've had to go in here and determine which direction is the correct one for rotational movement, and I've determined that is yaw right, and I set this to 20%. Why is that? Well, uh, if I get a control to turn full right, I don't want to turn the spin turn block 180 degrees around, and that's what it would do. It would turn backwards because it's getting a control to go full right, and that's as far right as the spin block is able to go. So instead, I want that at 36 degrees, which is about 20% of its actual drive direction. And that will allow me to uh, control how far this rudder is turning. And I'm, I might be able to go up a little bit on that. If I go up to 45, yeah, I've got uh, more or less the rudder is now turned perfectly horizontally. And so it's going to be turning me. It just doesn't look nearly as good, and I'm not really getting much more turn rate out of it. So rather I'd go maybe up to 35, and that's still a pretty aggressive turn from that rudder. So that's how those work. Uh, the large rudders come in sections. You pretty much have to build your rudder up, and you can pretty much mix and match these however you want. Each uh, additional block you add is going to add a little bit more control authority to the rudder. Uh, rudders, by the way, are only really able to turn you left or right. Uh, we'll get more into that in a moment, but for the moment, uh, when you're controlling a ship, generally you only control the forwards, back, and left, right, yaw axes. Uh, you don't need much up and down, uh, though we'll get into that with hydrofoils. You don't need a whole lot of uh, lift, uh, so you're not usually going to be trying to lift out of the water or press yourself down into the water. Uh, barring certain types of hydrofoils and that sort of thing. And roll control, again, is accomplished with hydrofoils, but uh, is often unnecessary in a boat. So really when you get right down to it, if you have forward movement and a rudder on a boat, then that boat is able to do boat movement uh, fairly effectively. All right, so we've taken a look at the propellers and the rudders. Those are, like I said, enough to get us our basic movement. Uh, we've also got air pumps here. Air pumps are a little special, and to demonstrate that, I'm going to go to the front of this vehicle I built up. This is just a simple, small vehicle, uh, fairly combat effective, uh, fairly expensive for its size, but uh, it does a pretty good job at what it does, which is shooting down missiles and distracting things. That's really its purpose in life. Alright, so I'm going to zoom in here. And up here we've got a compartment with a big gun in it, and we've got an air pump up here. So this air pump is computing this volume over here. It's uh, taking the air open area in this compartment, and it's pumping all the water out of it. Now in order to have water to pump out, it needs to be below sea level, but the compartment itself, you'll note, does not have water in it, despite being below sea level. The air pump is pumping the water out and replacing it with air. And that's really useful. Uh, another important thing to note here, uh, this air pump is operating in more or less a sealed volume. If you have an air pump, let's say, on top of your ship, like if I put one out here, 
it doesn't really have any volume to work with. There's no uh, sealed area for it to deal with. So it's just going to pretty much do nothing. That's not useful. Uh, if I try and put it lower down over here, again, it's going to do basically nothing because there's really not a whole lot of volume for it to work with. There's, in fact, no volume for it to work with. Uh, and every time water washes over this deck, it's going to get reflooded and have to repump the water off of the deck, which that can be moderately useful, but generally speaking, putting an air pump outside of a sealed area is not useful. Now, I've actually incorporated this into my armoring scheme because the armor on this vehicle is fairly heavy and thick. So what I've done here is, uh, let's get zoomed in, uh, I have an air pump in the sides of this air-gapped armor. So I've got metal and alloy on the outside, and then I've got a heavy armor beam on the inside protecting my, uh, in this case, my flat cannons uh, from getting shot. So that this air pump in here is taking this air gap and effectively making it add buoyancy to the vehicle because this is not a waterlogged area anymore. It is now an air-filled area. There's some graphical glitches with the water flowing through here, but this, uh, if I take a look at the UI on water pump, uh, this is definitely not breached. The uh, available buoyancy is 108 cubic meters, 0% is flooded, and it's staying that way. So that's how water pumps work. Uh, one more important thing to note on those, uh, if I come up here and I'm just going to uh, carve this turret off the front of the vehicle for a moment. Now this water pump up here was in this volume. It was treating the area that was occupied, or rather the volume that was occupied by that turret as unoccupied volume. Things on spin blocks do not count as volume for the sake of determining how much is available to an air pump. Abuse that however you will. I tend not to abuse it too much in my vehicles, but in the case of having a turret down here in a large area, I still want to keep that air pumped. I'm not going to dispense with the air pump. But on the other hand, I'm not going to put this turret or this uh, laser in here. That's my lambs laser. I'm not going to put that on a turret just for the sake of mo a more volume. It would be silly. I'm not going to go that cheaty with it. Uh, so another thing of note, the turret was occupying this gap. Well, remember how I said that the volume occupied by the turret does not count for the purposes of the air pump? That is important because that meant that the volume out here, this gap to open air, was also not being counted. Well, that's actually kind of interesting. Why, are, why is this not being flooded? Well, it's because this gap is above the line, or the sea level. If I got into really choppy seas where there's a lot of waves, and those waves start flowing over the top of this, they would have started splashing water down into here. And this air pump over here would have had to work extra in order to remove that and get the water out. That's important. Uh, that was not a sealed system despite appearing to be a sealed system. However, the air pump is still doing its job by forcing the water out of this volume uh, even though it's not a perfectly sealed system. So you can have gaps in your system as long as they're above the water line. And you can see I've taken advantage, advantage of that here. This gap is above the normal base layer of armor by one block. I've added a layer of armor here in order to keep this above the uh, flat level of my vehicle. So if the water line gets up to this base level of the vehicle, it still has to go a whole nother meter up before it starts flowing into that sealed area, or semi-sealed area, rather. And back here, if I take a look at these flat cannons, I've done the exact same thing. I have a turret up here, I have solid blocks down here mounted to the hull, and then the turret goes down into this volume down here, and if I uh, get out of that component, I've got a water pump back here, that is also in this volume that is keeping the, or rather an air pump, that is keeping the water out of the volume. So what exactly does this do? Uh, keeping the water pumped out decreases the amount of mass in the vehicle because water is obviously heavier than air. So if I'm filling volumes inside the vehicle with water instead of with, uh, or with air instead of with water rather, then that volume is going to be more buoyant. It's going to reduce the overall weight of the vehicle. And since air is lighter than water, 
that's actually providing us positive buoyancy and helping the vehicle to float. So those are the main purposes of air pumps. If I take a look at paddles, paddles are used uh, in paddle wheel designs. Uh, well, obviously. Um, paddles are usually arranged around a spin block on the side of a vehicle. So while you could put these like on the front of a vehicle and use the paddles to steer by spinning the spin block, uh, actually that would work fairly well depending on how crazy you want to go with your design, but uh, generally what you do with these is take a spin block and mount it to the side of your vehicle somewhere. And for the sake of argument, let's just go ahead and plop one right here. And then we're going to go back into the water tab and add some paddles in. So if I mirror here and add, let's say, five paddles over here. And let's do that with three rows. And let's put that, yeah, like so. All right, so this spin block here is now spinning or ready to spin. And if I activate this, it will give us forwards thrust. Uh, one thing, if you want to make sure that you don't have a headache, don't be in build mode on a spin block when you turn it on. It, it yeah, it can induce seizures. Anyway, uh, one thing here, the motor drive control is important. If I set motor drive all the way up, that is going to be useful. That is going to increase the amount of thrust I get out of the paddles. So I'm going to set this to continuous because I want this to continuously spin. And then I'm going to set spin rate control and set forwards back on that to full forwards. All right, so how do I tell if this is pushing me forwards or not? It's kind of doing strange things. And I want to see what exactly it's doing. Well, this is where I introduce you to a nice little feature of build mode, the backslash key. This is a key near your enter key, and it will show you all of the forces acting on a vehicle. If I put backslash on this, you can see I've got white lines going off into the distance on the front of the vehicle here. Uh, that's probably not what we want. If we look at these back here, uh, I have these steam propellers back here, and those are actually giving me the exact same direction. So maybe this is doing what I want. We'll see. If I turn that off, another way to check this, I can turn the forward movement way down. And now I can see, yes, those paddles are in fact turning in the direction I want. So for now, I'm going to turn the forward rate back off. And we're going to go back into edit mode on this. Uh, in order to demonstrate the next type of paddle, the articulated paddle. Now you might have noticed when I turned that paddle on that that side of the vehicle lifted out of the water. That's because the paddles apply force, not really caring about what direction that force is applied in. So if I look at this vehicle, the water line is just below the line of this paddle, sometimes reaching up to the uh, spin block on the paddle. So as this forward side rotates down into the water, it's going to be pushing down against the water and lifting the vehicle out of the water. Uh, that's usually not a good thing for boats, depending on the type of boat that you're trying to build. So uh, you want to be a little careful about that. Uh, if I could mount this higher, that would largely negate the problem. But if I mount it higher, then the paddles don't spend as much time in the water, so they're not going to give me as much forge thrust either. Uh, there's kind of a sweet spot there to hit, but it's pretty difficult to hit that given how much wave behavior can influence where the paddles are relative to the water. All right, so in order to solve that problem, we have the articulated paddle. I'm going to pop my mirror line back down and start uh, dealing with this here. Just replace these with the articulated paddle. And let's put another mirror line in there. Oop, helps if you actually uh, Hold down your shift key. And what the articulated paddle is going to do, that is going to apply force in only the forwards backwards direction of the vehicle. So effectively these paddles are only giving us thrust in the forwards backwards direction. If I go out here and say I want to set this back up to, in our spin rate control, 
100% forwards back. We're now yawing to the left because we just added force to the left, or to the rather to the right side of the center of mass. So we are our center of thrust is no longer aligned with our center of mass. We're now propelling the right side of the vehicle forwards, which is going to turn us towards the left. It's going to give us yaw left control. Uh, but we are traveling forwards at a fairly good rate of speed, and this is helping us travel forwards faster. So I'm going to break that off of there, and let's take a look at the next component in line, the hydrofoil. Oh, hydrofoils. I love these things. These save so many subpar boat designs that it's not even funny. Uh, you can put these hydrofoils, literally just throw them on pretty much anywhere that's a submerged area. Note that that can be in the same volume as an air pump and still operate. Uh, counterintuitively, they just have to be on the vehicle below the waterline. So on this particular vehicle, I have a gap on the bottom of the armor. Um, there's just this gap in here. There's an air pump in here, so this is full of air. This is contributing to buoyancy, and there's a bunch of hydrofoils in here. Well, the hydrofoils are actually controlling the pitch and the roll and the altitude of the vehicle all in one. Yeah, uh, they're pretty awesome. If I take a look at this, they've got translational up movement, they've got rotational pitch up, and they've got rotational roll right. That's important. Uh, these hydrofoils are doing three things for us. They're stabilizing the roll of the vehicle, they're stabilizing the pitch of the vehicle, and they are making sure that the vehicle stays at a consistent altitude. And that's really important. This boat is slightly too heavy to uh, sit in the water at a good altitude, and the nose is heavier than the back, so it has a tendency to nose down. If I take a look at this area up here, you can see that nosing down would be a bad thing because we've got this lovely gap up here. So if this vehicle noses down into the water, the water is going to flow up and into this gap up here, and if it does that a little bit, then the effect of the nose down is going to be amplified because I'm adding weight to the nose, I'm adding water into this nose area and that's going to push the nose down further. So more water is going to enter. This water pump here, or this air pump here, is going to get completely overwhelmed, and we are effectively not going to be getting anything out of this at all. Uh, it's We're just going to nose dive straight into the water, and this boat's not even going to float. So I've added a bunch of hydrofoils down at the bottom. Those are effectively keeping me far enough out of the water and helping me nose up so that I avoid all of those nasty problems. Another thing that they're doing is giving me roll control authority. And that wouldn't seem like a huge deal on a boat, but it's actually a pretty big deal because uh, waves exist and they can hit your vehicle on the side, which means rolling the vehicle. Uh, they, you can also have cannons on the side that might not have recoil absorbers or enough recoil absorbers like the case of these uh, flat batteries that I've got here. And if that happens, these are going to be contributing to the vehicle's roll my main turret up here is pretty big too. Um, uh, that can really contribute to the roll of the vehicle if it's firing, say, a broadside off towards an enemy. And in general, the roll of the vehicle it can be destabilized by all sorts of things. The hydrofoils are going to help me with that too. In order to control that, I have AI PIDs. Again, we're going to get into how to set those up later. But those PIDs are effectively acting as a stabilizing force and they are controlling those PIDs in order to exert that stabilization. All right, so that brings us to the last component here, sails. Sails are the component type that I know the least about, and if someone more experienced than I wants to chime in on sails in the comments, by all means, go ahead. You will not offend me in the slightest. Uh, the sail has a few different things going on here. There's the main block that is effectively the control block of the sail. It generates the sail. There's the sail attachment that uh, creates or lengthens the sail in one of two different directions. And there's a square rig sail main block, which basically allows the sail to be rendered as a square instead of kind of an arcing style. There's also the sail winch, which gives you control to raise and lower the sail. Uh, and that will effectively let you lower the sail if you're trying to travel into the wind, which um, 
means that you don't have wind blowing directly backwards against the sail and inhibiting your vehicle's direction of movement. Then you've got two different types of weather vane. These are both, as far as I can tell, cosmetic, but they do let you know which direction the wind is coming from. If I plunk one of these down up here... Uh, yeah, they're saying the wind's coming from that direction. Uh, interesting thing of note about wind vanes, uh, these are physically accurate. The tail fin side back here is going to be the direction the wind is traveling to. So wind is coming from this direction to this direction, meaning that this is pointing into the wind. All right, so the way sails are usually configured is again with a spin turn block. Uh, usually you'll put one of these down and you'll put a mast coming up off of that. And then you'll have something like, say, some uh, outrigging here. I, I don't really know the nautical terminology for this. And let's go ahead and pop that out there. So let's just go ahead and build a sail. Uh, we can put a square rig sail main block down here. And we're just going to add a bunch of attachments out on the end. And let's go ahead and put a winch out at the end of it. Then we're just going to extend that upwards. And we've got a couple of square sails. Uh, now, the spin turn block down here, controlling that is a little bit interesting. I can't just push that in the direction that I want to move. I can't have the AI control it based on any of my normal axes. And I haven't figured out exactly how the rotational movement control for this works yet. Uh, if anyone knows, please again let me know in the comments down below. Uh, rotational movement control is definitely not going to work for that. There's AI settings that look like they do help with that. If I uh, put down, uh, I have to go out of build mode for this. If I was to put down an AI mainframe here and open it up, there's an additional routine called sailing in here, and there's also FTD sailing, and I don't know exactly how these work. I suspect add FTD sailing is going to control the sails for the most part. If I, like, I don't want to roll too much and, uh, oh, hey, it took off and ran. Okay, so apparently that is what you want. Uh, I suspect, now if you get into the additional here, there's the FTD sailing, and there's also a regular sailing. This regular sailing one, I suspect you're going to have to do more manual setup of the spin turn block and the winches. The FTD sailing control, I suspect, is going to be a lot more uh, easy to use. It's going to effectively control things a lot more automatically. So you can see we've actually got some additional force coming out of these sails going forwards. Uh, those force lines are indicating that we are getting forwards propulsion out of these. So that's exactly what we want, and the AI seems to be controlling the sails in order to get move movement out of it. So, um, one nautical thing here that is not immediately apparent is that sails, even though they are wind-based, allow you to travel somewhat into the wind. Now, if the wind is coming straight um, from the nose of the vehicle to the rear of the vehicle, uh, the sails aren't going to do you any good as far as uh, countering that. They're not going to give you any propulsion directly against the wind. But you can sort of tack to one side or the other, and you can get pretty close to traveling in the direction the wind is coming from. Uh, usually in a historical vehicle, that was a function of the keel and the rudder, both uh, keeping the vehicle straight, uh, despite the sideways forces on a vehicle. And then the sails would effectively exert a uh, partially sideways force on the vehicle that would tra be translated into a forwards directional control. Uh, the, for all the physics on that, uh, you'd have to go up and read on a sailing book. Again, that is very much not my area of expertise, so I'm not even going to pretend to uh, explain how that works. All right, so the AI here, as you can see, is doing a pretty nice job of controlling those sails. And that appears to be all you would need in order to set up basic sail control. 
So the next thing we're going to take a look at is basically the uh, very low level, what do I need to make a water vehicle work question. And for that, very simply, you need forge propulsion and you need a rudder. That's all you have to have for a basic sailboat uh, or, or uh, any sort of boat, really. Uh, even if I'm using propellers, that's all I need. But that's obviously not all we can have. Now, if I was to go out here into the water tab, I can use propellers. I can use them on the back of the ship and the front of the ship uh, facing side to side in order to give me additional yaw control authority. So I can put these back here. And if I put them fairly well in line with the center of mass, again, we want that so that we don't get accidental roll control on these. Uh, I can set these to a turner preset and these will help me turn the ship more quickly. And you can note I'm just using these buttons up here. That's the quick and dirty way of saying I want this thing or this uh, thruster to do one thing only and it gets the job done. So you've got your forward reverse control authority and you've got your yaw control authority. Uh, again, that's usually provided by a rudder, but can also be provided by uh, these propulsion systems, or in this case, the propellers, uh, facing to the sideways uh, in front of or behind the center of mass. Again, if you remember the concept of movement tutorial, the further away from the center of mass the rudder and or the propellers are, the more control authority they will be able to exert in relation to the uh, vehicle. So another thing to look at here is the rudder. Uh, the description on the rudder says that the force imparted is relative to the vehicle mass. Uh, rudders are incredibly powerful because of this. These basic rudders here, if I was to strip off these propulsion systems, or rather the propellers back there, game calls them propulsion systems when you're mousing over them for some reason, if I was to strip off this rudder, I can show you here, these propellers are not set up to provide yaw control authority, even though they could technically do so. Uh, I have right now no yaw control authority. So I'm going to put one of these rudders down. And it's turning me easily as fast as that huge rudder that I had on the back before. Why is that? Well, it's because the force exerted by this tiny little boat rudder back here if I look at this thing back here, it's only ex existing in a 1x2 space. It's tiny. Um, that tiny little boat rudder is exerting enough force to very handily control this very heavy vehicle. Now, as if your vehicle is extremely large and extremely light, that actually might not be the case. You might need to add multiple rudders. But if you have a very heavy, compact vehicle, one of these is more than likely going to be enough. Now, what happens if you add more of these? Well, you're, again, adding more rotational control authority. You're adding more yaw control authority. Now, if I keep adding these, at some point, I can turn faster than I can move. And that just starts looking silly. Realistically, boats never steered like this. And it's just, it's, it's silly. It makes your boat twitchy, and I personally don't like to do that. Uh, you could smooth that out with the PID and just be able to execute incredibly fast turns whenever you wanted to, which is really useful in some scenarios. So I'm definitely not blaming anyone for uh, using a ton of rudders on their boats. But the way that works is just seems a little bit gamey to me. I don't know. That's personal preference, mostly. So I've already mentioned several things you can do with hydrofoils. Those are amazing. I haven't really mentioned how you can control air pumps. Oddly enough, you can control air pumps, and that gives you a surprising amount of control. Uh, if I look at this volume up here in the nose of the ship, this air pump is what is pumping air out of that. If I look at this, I've got a full uh, control system in here. Why? Well, this air pump lets me effectively control both lift, or the hover direction, and because it's in front of the center of mass, in fact, this... Uh, cavity here as a hole is in front of the center of mass. That's important, the whole cavity has to be in front of the center of mass. Uh, the rotational movement would let me control pitch with this. 
So I could turn the air pump off or lower the amount of output I'm getting out of it in order to raise or lower the nose of the vehicle or increase the amount of buoyancy of the vehicle. And that is a perfectly valid method of control. Uh, submarines very often use that. In fact, uh, if you think of a regular submarine, they had ballast tanks around the outside of the submarine that they could flood or pump air into at will. And that would effectively uh, allow the submarine to surface. Uh, when they pumped air into those ballast tanks, it was expelling the water, and that made them more buoyant than the water around them, because they were carrying less weight. Likewise, they could open the ballast tanks and let them be flooded, which would let the submarine submerge. Really a very interesting uh, solution to a fairly complex problem. And from the depths, we can use hydrofoils to do the same thing with a lot more control accuracy. So in general, I tend to prefer using hydrofoils for the purposes of the air pumps. Um, technically, if I wanted to, uh, these ones that I put in this spaced armor over here, I could actually use the uh, air pumps over here to exert rotational control authority, or roll control authority rather, because they are left and right of the center of mass. Uh, I'm not going to do that because that would be kind of silly and reduce the overall buoyancy of the vehicle. And really, as we mentioned in the concept of movement, uh, if you are adding control authority in one direction, uh, for instance, these air pumps down here are adding lift control authority. They're giving me the ability to go up, uh, or at least uh, reducing the amount of control authority my uh, hydrofoils down here have to exert in order to travel upwards. Since those are doing that for me, the hydrofoils don't have to work nearly as hard. So I have the air pumps uh, helping me keep this thing floating, and then the hydrofoils are just going to act as my control mechanism in order to keep the vehicle stable. All right, so we've looked at all the components, we've looked at all of the um, control methods. Uh, one that I didn't mention here is you can use propellers for pitch as well and for lift if you've got a particularly heavy boat that really wouldn't float on its own. What you can do is put these propellers down under the boat and you could use these for pitch, you could use them for the up-down translational movement just to keep the boat at a consistent altitude. Again, I tend to prefer not to do that, but it is possible. Oh, uh, another thing of note that I haven't mentioned about these huge thrusters, and this is a common recurring theme throughout From the Depths, uh, these only need the center block of the propulsion unit, and I am going to use the term propulsion unit here very specifically because this also applies to jets, it applies to custom jets, it applies to ion engines, basically anything like this. Only the center block of this needs to have open water in front of it. And let's say I just uh, completely encase this. Uh, I'm going to put metal blocks all over the place on this thing. And if I look at this thing, it's not giving me any notices here. If I put this block, this one block here, it's going to say, due to the placement of the block, the force output is scaled to 0%. That means this is producing no force because it's blocked. If I remove that one block, this uh, propeller is now fully operational. So really, I only need that one block clear in order for that propeller to be operational. Now, if I was to seal this like so, uh, you'll see that I'm getting one-eighth of the force output. That's what 12.5% is. That's one-eighth. Now, what that tells me is that I need an eight-block long free space in a one-by-one one area directly in front of, or rather behind, the center of that propeller. So if I was to say I've got two here, do three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, this block there should not interfere, or rather should be the last block that interferes with the propeller. So yeah, that's getting 87.5%. If I break this and go down one more block, this is now exerting full propulsion, even though the ostensible direction is blocked. So that's important to note, and that's the, actually the same for small propellers. It just so happens that since those are one by one, and they need a one by one space behind them, 
you can't really pull as many tricks with armoring those. Just not going to work out real well for you. Alright, so another thing of note with water movement. Water exerts a lot of drag force. And I mean a lot of drag force. So keeping your sloped blocks underwater, or keeping the front of your boat sloped is very important. Uh, slopes reduce drag. And that is going to be a very big deal when you start talking about traveling forward at any sort of high rate of speed through water. This boat does not have a particularly sharp nose. There's a lot of blunt edges here. Uh, the, obviously everything is angled. Uh, even this over here is still got an angled block on it, but it's not really helping me with my drag because it's got a block below it. And I'll go more into how that works in the armoring tutorial. But uh, for now, that is just assume that the front of this vehicle is actually pretty inefficient as far as drag goes. Uh, I can see that my center of drag is fairly well aligned with the middle of the vehicle. It's going up and down as I go into and out of the water, because the higher up the nose is out of the water, the better my drag is going to be, and it's going to change where that drag is occurring on the vehicle. Alright, another thing we're going to look at here is all the way at the back of the vehicle. Remember how I mentioned we could control the yaw of the vehicle with the propellers? Well, we're going to set that up here. And another thing of note, these are steam propellers. I'm going to cover these when we go over our steam tutorial, which is going to be right after the devs finish their rework of steam, but uh, for now I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, just assume they act pretty much like normal propellers, but can exert more force. So these propellers are just back here doing nothing. I've got one on either side of the center of mass, and they're spread fairly far apart. Not super far, but somewhat. So what I'm going to do with these is set them to have a little bit of yaw control. So this one's going to give us, actually I'm going to set that up to about 0.5. That one is 0.5 yaw, and over here we're going to give it 0.5 in the other direction. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and change that to a full one in each direction. All right, so what's going on here? Well, um, our steam is fairly slow to respond, but now you can see that these propellers are turning the vehicle intentionally, despite having no rudders on the vehicle. This is what's known as differential steering. Effectively, I'm using forwards thrust on one side of the vehicle, reverse thrust on the other side of the vehicle, and I am trading my ability to always be moving forward fairly quickly for the ability to literally turn in place if I want to. Uh, that can be handy. Um, again, I'm only using these two propellers back here, so I'm reducing the complexity of the system. But I'm also concentrating all of my points of failure on these two propellers. If one of these gets blown off, I have no control over my vehicle anymore. I can't control yaw, I can't even go forward in a straight line anymore because I have no yaw control authority without both of these propellers being here. So the last thing we're going to look at here is AI configuration. Alright, so I've got the AI mainframe here and I've got the settings of window open. And let's get out from underwater so we can see clearly. Now the selected behaviors in here, you're going to want this to be naval. If I delete this routine, by default when you come into a vanilla AI, you're going to have all these different tabs. Uh, you're going to want to use add behavior to add a naval behavior. Uh, some of these other behaviors can be quite useful, but in general for ships, naval behavior is pretty close to what you want. Now in this particular case, this vehicle is designed to be fairly up close and personal. So I have a range of, let's say around 400 to 500 meters. And I want to leave if I get below 300 meters. And I want to keep directly broadside to the enemy. And then I just click on that over here and that activates the behavior. That's pretty simple. There's really not a whole lot to it. These four settings here, you've got enter broadside below four or below a range that will mean that you turn to the broadside angle of the vehicle, uh, which is in this case is a 90 degree angle to the target. And uh, if we get beyond 510 meters away from the vehicle, we're going to leave that broadside angle and turn towards the target. And if we get below 300 ang uh, meters, we're going to leave the broadside angle and turn away from the target. 
That's really all there is to that. And in fact, I could go a little bit higher with this and that will work just fine. So that's really all there is to setting up a naval AI. Um, there's other things you can do in here. Uh, when you go into the adjustments tab, you will want to make sure that this is set to on water. Uh, that way it will use ocean pathfinding and avoid trying to path over land. And you also want to avoid all vehicles, obviously, so that you don't run into your own vehicles. Um, altitude clamping is really not useful. Now the sea surface pathfinding here is quite useful. Uh, in this case, I have probably about 10, maybe up to 15 meters of blocks below the water line. So if I set this to 20 meters of water depth required, it's going to try and path me through areas that are at least 20 meters deep. And if I set my turning circle higher or lower here, it's going to try and pathfind the vehicle that is trying to determine the route of the vehicle in advance uh, with a turn that is no smaller than 100 meters long. So if I try and turn 90 degrees, it's going to try and uh, go 100 meters forward as it executes that turn. Uh, another tool here is the extra options. There's the terrain height prediction time. That's basically just looking at the terrain and predicting how or going how far into the future uh, we're looking for our movement and seeing if there is terrain there. Uh, so in this case, since I'm actually using steam, which is fairly slow to respond, it might be to my advantage to turn this up. Uh, just note the higher you have this, the more work the game has to do in order to actually check the path of the vehicle. So if you're spawning a ton of these in, you want to keep that fairly low. Alright, so that's it for this tutorial. Uh, boat movement is pretty simple and straightforward, and I don't think you're going to have much trouble with it, but uh, hopefully I've showed you some tips and tricks and things you wouldn't have otherwise seen. Uh, next tutorial is up going to be on air movement, and I might split that into a couple tutorials actually, because there are a lot, are a lot of things going on when you start talking about air movement. There's a lot of, a lot of different types of air movement that you can have. Anyway, hope to see you next time, and good luck.